is Cambria Alpha Cobb. I am um, a technology specialist and a patent agent at Fish and Richardson in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a job trajectory that really kind of interfaces the gap between science and law. Um, but really, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is intellectual property law, a little bit about my personal background and kind of the typical career path that people go on, pros and cons, and if we get time, we'll go a little bit further. So first of all, what is IP law? Intellectual property law. So intellectual property is an invention, right? It's a discovery. It's an idea. It can be scientific. It can be non-scientific. But essentially, this invention is what we call intellectual property. And so then a lot of people ask, okay, well, then how is this different from a patent? Well, a patent is the actual physical document. It's a contract with a government. Essentially, the government says, we will give you this patent if you disclose to us everything we need to know in order to do your invention. And so this kind of contract with the government is called the patent. And that is actually where I come in or where people who work in intellectual property law firms come in. The way that you disclose this invention, the way that you tell everyone everything you would need to know to do your invention is called the patent application. And that is why we need people like PhD scientists who really know the background, who really know the science in order to put together these written patent applications and get a patent that is worthy. All right, so moving on, a little bit about my personal background and a typical career path that one would take. Um, so my background is pretty typical. Most of you probably have very similar credentials to here, but really what I want to focus on here is this transition, going from getting my PhD, doing a short postdoc, and then getting a position at an intellectual property law firm. Um, I was doing my PhD. I really liked science. I really liked doing bench science, but I realized it probably wasn't what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I started looking into what alternative careers were, right? Met a few people, started networking. And I realized I really liked that interface between law and science. I really liked that idea of owning your idea, right? We're all taught as researchers, you want to own your project. You really want to be the one, you know everything, you know what the next steps are going to be, and you know where you can take it. Well, so what if you could, you know, translate that once you get a really neat idea, you need to have that motivation, you need to have that ownership. And that is kind of like the gut of what I felt when I heard about intellectual property law. You're giving people an opportunity to really actually own your invention. So while I was doing a sh very, very short postdoc after my PhD, I started doing an internship at the tech transfer office at my university, just to kind of get my hands wet, just to kind of feel, okay, would I really like doing this job? And at that point, I reached out to a lot of the alumni from my university, mainly people involved in intellectual property law, and I started talking to them. I started saying, hey, why do you like your job? Do you feel like you actually need a science background? Do you think you need your PhD? How much is it helping? And through that, I actually got involved with a group called Dilworth IP in Connecticut, which is a, a small law firm. They do amazing, amazing work. Um, and so I started working part time with them during my postdoc. Thankfully, my PI was extremely supportive of me taking this alternative career. Um, and so I was able to work part time and really kind of get my hands wet. Um, after working there for a little bit. I then transitioned into a much bigger law firm um, in Boston, Massachusetts called Fish and Richardson. Um, and there I became a patent agent. So that kind of transitions into what the typical career path is for someone with a background in science going into intellectual property law. Um, now I say here a PhD to a patent attorney that really is dependent on your field. So in biochemistry and cell biology, typically they do hire people with PhDs, but often also people with masters with a lot of research experience are highly qualified as well. So just that's kind of a caveat right there. Um, so essentially what we do is you start off as a technology specialist, and it is exactly what it sounds like. You are the technical expert. It's kind of like what you were trained to do, right? Like you're really good at the science you do, so we're going to hire you for that science. We want you to be able to teach us us meaning older attorneys who are not as connected to the science, we want you to be able to tell us, okay, hey, like this is what's going on in the cancer field right now. This is what's going on in genetics right now. Like you need to know this so that when we talk to the clients who are the actual inventors, who are the real scientists, like you need to know this so that you don't look like an idiot, basically. <laughs> so our job, like I said here, is to be the technology specialist. Then at that point, what you can do is you take this exam called the patent bar exam. Now, I know we've all heard about the bar exam, meaning like, oh, you're an attorney, you have to pass the bar exam to be a practicing attorney. Well, this is a little bit different. This is actually a federal exam. So 
Um, once you take the patent a bar exam and you become a patent agent, you can practice anywhere in the United States. Um, and you can't do anything else attorney, like you can't, pro you know, you can't do any other law, <laughs> but you can do intellectual property law. After you, do, you become a patent agent, you can then go to law school. You can then pass the state bar exam, become an actual patent attorney. And then as you keep working and working and working, you can either then become a partner in an in intellectual property law firm. You can become in-house counsel, go work with a pharmaceutical company, or you can say do licensing in a university setting. Now I know most of you are looking at that and being like, really? <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I just, I just finished my PhD and maybe a postdoc. You really want me to go back for more schooling? But just so you know, it's not as bad as it looks. Um, I finished my PhD and I did a short postdoc, and now I've been working for almost two years now. Most law firms actually, or, yeah, most law firms, they don't actually want you to go to law school right off the bat. You want to make sure that you're committed. You want to make sure you like this, right? If you don't like it, do you really want to commit to another three years of school and potentially a bunch of debt? Like, nobody wants to do that. So the way I did it is actually fairly common. I started working in a, a small firm, transitioned to a bigger firm. I'm now going to be there for about a year, and I've applied, and I'm actually going to start law school in the fall. Now, the lucky thing is, if you're smart, you'll work in a law firm for a little bit, and the law firm will pay for your law degree. So you're going to leave you know, three years down the road. I'm going to have five years of experience in a law firm, and I'm going to have a law degree with absolutely no debt. Oh, and wait, they'll also pay your salary during that time. Granted, you have to give a lot of sweat and blood and work at the same time. <laughs> but at the same time, it's not as bad as it looks. I know we're all looking at that and being like, please, I don't want more schooling. But it's not as bad as it looks. And in all honesty, they hire you for your PhD. So they really, really want that PhD. The JD are kind of just a couple letters that you throw after your name. All right, so some quick pros and cons. God, I'm doing good on timing. Um, the pros are that you are still very heavy into the scientific field. Like you really, like I said, you're the technical expert in your firm. Now granted, we're all kind of taught, we become really good at one specific thing. But really, when you take a step back, you realize you're becoming really good at that one specific thing, but in that process, you're really learning about a magnitude of other things. And you're learning about how to quickly grasp scientific concepts. You're going to lectures, and you, it might not even be something you work on, and yet you understand the lecture. Right? Like you know a lot more than you think you do in your tiny, tiny research group. And that is what they want. They want you to be able to quickly grasp these new ideas and be able to teach these scientific ideas. And that's a really big point. And I'm not saying teaching like go to a lecture hall and teach to people. It's actually you're going in and you're talking with a partner in your group. And you're saying, hey, this is what this invention is about. Like I've been talking to these ventures at this university or at this biotech company. And like this is their cool new finding. Like it's really neat because of this and this and this. And like we need to get a patent on it. And like, you know, I'm going to draft up the patent. I know the background. I can do all this because it's a science. I got the science. Leave it to the partners or leave it to people with education to do the legal aspects. But we get to do the science. Um, some of the cons. What I really felt like the hardest part about my transition, I think, was you lose that ability to make the scientific decisions. You know, like in the lab, we kind of, you're working with the PI, so you maybe don't have full liberties, but at the same time, you get to kind of direct the project. And you're like, this is a really neat idea. Oh my gosh, we could take it this way. And you can't really do that anymore, right? Like you can, you can write about it. Like if someone comes and they're like, hey, like this is our really cool idea. This is what we think. You can then, in, you know, writing out the patent application and talking to the mentors, you can be like, hey, would you ever consider doing this? Like, could you actually apply it for this? Could you do this? And so you can help that way, but you don't actually have the physical, you know, you are running the whole experiment. Um, billable hours was a very, very different change. Um, I put no paid coffee breaks. That, that, that is, that is the, the epitome of my difficulties. Because, <laughs> you know, in graduate school or you know, a, lot, a lot of jobs, you're paid on a salary. And working in a law firm is different. So in a law firm, you're paid on billable hours, which means your hours are directly billed to the client. So the firm is just kind of an in-between. And so when you're working on something, you have to actually be able to say for every, we do it in every six minutes. I know some law firms who do it in every three minutes. But every six minutes, you have to be able to know what you were doing. Um, you can start a timer, and you can just kind of um, 
keep it running when you're like, okay, yeah, I'm working on this application and that's fine, you know? But you, you don't want, the client doesn't really want to be paying for you to go and chat and drink coffee and get your lunch break and maybe go work out, you know? Like, they don't want to be doing that. And so it really is, it's kind of a, like, yeah, you might be at work from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but like, you're not going to actually be able to bill for that whole time. And granted, they compensate you very, very well by the hour, so it's not the end of the world, but it is definitely something you have to get used to because you're kind of keeping track of all your time. You're keeping track of what you're doing at what points. And, um, skills required at step. I'll just put this up real quick, but I think my timing's done. Um, like I said, you really have to be able to write and communicate science. That's the biggest thing. As you progress down this you know, cascade, I put arrows because you really need all of this for each step, but as you go down and down and down, you get a little further away from the science, but even when you're a partner in house council licensing, like you still have to understand the bigger picture. You really have to understand what the science is doing and how it is interacting with the rest of the scientific field. Otherwise, you're never going to get actual protection for your idea. So thank you guys. Um, I look forward to talking with some of you for more questions later.